the fifth industrial revolution. We have been talking about it for some time on this platform. Why did they get interested in this? One, we are seeing conditions on earth change and it will take some luck and some interventions to really make life and keep life on earth sustainable. I'm glad we have uh, action for climate change and I hope we'll continue to do more such things. Also space, the final frontier from Star Trek. Uh, we are going into space more often and we are going deep, which is a good thing. With the web telescope, we are seeing what we have never seen before even better. That said, if I look at life on Earth and life in space, the biggest barrier to it is human bodies, right? We can't live in extreme environments. We can't survive in extreme environments. So will health technology really be the basis for fifth industrial revolution where we live a life very different from today? These are the things we discuss here and these are the things I discussed in my course at Seton Hall. And today it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Shana Pandya to talk about this. What a, what a pleasure, Shana, to have you. And um, I'm going to introduce you and I know I will not do justice to it. So bear with me and then, you know, correct me wherever I make a mistake, but you have so much energy. You are a physician, a scientist, astronaut, an aquanaut. That means you live under, you have lived underwater for a long duration. Uh, you're a pianist, a martial artist, a speaker, a skydiver, an aspiring pilot. Uh, you have degrees in neuroscience, medicine, and space. You're a teacher. You teach world extreme medicine, operational space medicine, teacher of medicine and technology. You are director for the space medicine program at International Institute of Astronautical Sciences. Uh, I believe director of medical research at Orbital Assembly Corp. Life Sciences Team Lead for Association of Space Flight Professionals. Uh, medical advisor to many space and medicine companies, including a role at Luxonic. Um, you have been featured in multiple ads that are spat feature positions like the Fix ad. You're a brand ambassador. You're an ambassador for India, frankly. So it's such a pleasure to have you here, Shana. What did I miss? Uh, you know, I think that's a great start. I think a lot, uh, anything else that might have um, uh, been left by the wayside, hopefully it'll come out in our conversation today. I'm really excited to be here. I think this is going to be a fun hour together. Wonderful, wonderful. So let me start by asking you, how do you manage so much? Um, you know, it's really funny. I, uh, you know, if I'm speaking flippantly, lots of caffeine. Um, and, uh, you know, it's uh, caffeine makes the world go round. Uh, and if I'm speaking more seriously, I think it's just a lot of time management, a lot of scheduling. And in fact, you know, um, I've started to believe more and more in the power of saying no. And so... Mm -hmm. Um, you know, when you're getting started and looking for opportunities, the the mindset is to say yes to everything um, and look for new pathways for yourself. And when you're working on really interesting and important things um, that you, you want, um, the challenge is say no to new opportunities um, so that you can focus and bring value where you want to and that so you don't burn yourself out along the way. So, um, you know, I think there's a big value in saying no when the time is right. Yeah, there is big value in saying no, and especially if you know what you want, then you can really focus and drive forward with that. Now, why focus on space? I mean, you yourself have said uh, at some point in time that space is there to kill you. Uh, yeah. So why, why pick up space as the focus you want to be killed? Uh, no, not at all. It's um, it's really funny because when um, I talk to people about space medicine, um, the number one question I get is, how are those things related? Because, you know, space is a thing and medicine is a thing, but I never saw them as coming together. And then, you know, my my segue to get people interested is, well, saying, well, space is trying to kill you. So, of course, we need a field called space medicine. And to delve into that a little bit more, um, we talk about the challenges of the spaceflight environment. So how is space, how does medicine and 
space different? How is the environment different compared to our Earth environment? Um, and basically, we talk about the altered gravity. So when we're on the International Space Station, we have, our astronauts are living in microgravity or weightlessness. And then when we talk about the Moon or Mars, there's gravity, but there's way less gravity. 17% on the Moon, 38% on Mars. We talk about increased radiation risks. We talk about psychological risks isolation and confinement and um, we talk about um the hostile environment aspect the fact that our day night cycles are altered um when it comes to living on the international space station one sunrise one sunset cycle every mm -hmm. 90 minutes so 16 sunrise sunset cycles for 24 hours and then if you're at the moon's equator it's 14 days of day and 14 days of night um and so and then we talk about the distance from earth finally so the further out we go um the more autonomous our crews have to be. Yes. So when we talk about sending a crew to the International Space Station, it's still real time. There's no time delay. Um, but by the time we get to Mars, the distance of um, the the that telecommunication um, waves have to travel, depending on the alignment of Earth and Mars, the round trip conversation can take up to 46 minutes. Um, so now if you have a medical emergency on Mars, you don't have time to radio back to Earth for help. And so this is why I say that space is trying to kill us because of all these hazards and that we need um, to be aware of and to mitigate in order to keep astronauts not just surviving, but thriving in the space flight environment. So how is that different from, let's say, the 1400s or the 1300s when the Spanish or the Nordics got on their ships to explore the world? Um, same challenges, different challenges? Yeah, you know, you bring up a good question. And so... Um, when we talk about preparing for space, we talk about using space-like or analogous to space or analog environments to prepare yeah. for space. And so we call them um, ice environments. Uh, so ice in that ice, isolated, confined, extreme environments. Um, they're resource limited, they're remote. Um, and so when we, we use the example of centuries past, we can argue that those are an example of austere environment, um, especially compared to the luxuries of modern medicine today. Um, especially when you're sa you're sailing on a ship, you have throngs of people. Um, we didn't necessarily know how to mitigate scurvy all the time. Um, there's the challenges of infectious disease in a closed population. Um, and then there's them leaving their creature comforts. Remember, for them, their life is an austere. Right. And then when they arrive into the new world, well, it's, you know, the exact same principle. At some point, the first hospital has to be built in the first settlement overseas. Um, how do we do that? What settlement uh, or what uh, what supply um, and resupply do we need to bring those uh, medical um, supplies? How do we build the infrastructure? So it is analogous in some sense. And you know, the, the heartening part of it is that humans have done it before in an austere environment. Now we just need to do it in a little bit more ambitious way. Right, right. And so what I'm hearing is the purpose of space medicine is to make sure that humans can live for extended periods in space. Is that it or is there more to it? It's a little bit more. It's that's a, a big part of it. Um, but part of it is, you know, the mission, the, the flight surgeon's job doesn't end when the mission's over. Uh, in fact, part of their job is just getting started. And so, for example, when we see astronauts being carried out with a hero's welcome, um, mm -hmm. when they arrive in a Soyuz capsule on Earth, um, part of it is, you know, pomp and circumstance. But part of it is that the astronauts are so deconditioned that if they were to stand up, there's a high chance that they would faint right. um, from decompensation. And so. So um, there is prehabilitation before the mission, um, giving astronauts an individualized workout and nutrition program to um, build out their endurance, their muscles, um, their cardiovascular endurance, and then keeping them uh, healthy on station. Um, so for example, astronauts have to do one and a half to two hours of aerobic and resistive exercise six days of the week while on station to prevent their muscles from losing mass, to prevent their bones from losing density. And then post-mission, it's more of that rehab um, and bringing the astronauts back to their baseline um, compared to what they were on Earth. So it's um, part of it takes place in space. A lot of it comes down to prevention, starting at selection, as well as um, rehabilitation and then post-flight rehabilitation. Right. And uh, right now, the astronauts, uh, at least the ones who are really going into space for longer durations, not, you know, the uh, fancy commercial flight, they tend to be super athletes and being able to do that with them must be challenging. Uh, 
but you know, sounds like you're really on the frontier of medicine and really dealing with challenges we don't have to deal with us on earth on day to day basis. So what are we learning there that in, that has already been adapted uh, in medicine on earth or, or you know, what way do you see progress from that perspective? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, definitely, um, you know, I often get the question, but what has space done for me lately? How can we justify sending humans to space when we have so many, so many problems on Earth? Um, and the answer really is that it's not, you know, an either or phenomenon. The two are not mutually exclusive. And we derive a lot of benefit directly and indirectly from sending humans to space. So, for example, the amount of science, research um, and progress um, that we learn from experiments on station, whether it's, you know, learning about basic molecular cell structure, um, versus engineering new pharmaceuticals, versus um, studying neuromuscular or uh, or bone diseases or osteoporosis in space gives us a lot of insight to pathological con conditions on Earth. Um, and then there's the indirect spin-offs, the you know the technologies we made for space, but that actually end up having benefit for these um, similarly remote and resource limited environments. So, for example, iodine resin filtration systems to provide clean water on the International Space Station have been spun off to provide clean water in remote villages in, in Africa. Mm -hmm. um, handheld ultrasound uh, used on the ISS has also been used to provide maternal care to remote Arctic populations in Canada. Um, the atmospheric scrubbers in closed loop life support systems that are used to keep the atmosphere clean and healthy on um, the International Space Station are used on Earth um, to keep um, clean air in doctor's offices, ORs, and even in the transport uh, supply chain to extend the shelf life of products. So there's lots of examples of technology transfer that um, have come from Earth that um, uh, have provided benefit uh, uh, on Earth, uh, that have come from space that provide benefit on Earth. And how do you find about those? Uh, is there a technology transfer office in space that you can contact or... How, how yeah, absolutely. Go there is. Yeah. And so both um, NASA and ESA, the European Space Agency, they invest heavily into technology transfer. So there's definitely offices dedicated to technology transfer. Um, so you just Google technology transfer program, NASA or ESA, and you'll get a um, uh, entire web pages and offices dedicated to, uh, in some cases, helping commercialize these um, technologies to help bring benefit to Earth. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Now, I want to come back to, you know, uh, the R&D that you described is happening in space. But before that, um, uh, you also talked about gravity or lack of gravity. You talked mm -hmm. about radiation. You also talked about the benefits of microgravity, right, and in, in medicine. So how do you really reconcile all of that? I mean, we are going into zero gravity or, like you said, 17 or 38 percent gravity environments. Uh, which is not good for human body, but then microgravity is. So how do you reconcile? Yeah, so um, I wouldn't say that microgravity or zero G is um, good for humans, but we do adapt to it. So the bottom line is that every bodily system is affected by the weightlessness environment. Um, and so uh, everything from our immune systems to our cardiovascular systems, to our bones, to our brains, um, our central nervous systems, they're all affected by being in the microgravity um, environment. Um, and the interesting thing is we have all this data we have, bill, we have 4 billion years of evolution saying how humans do in the 1G environment, and the answer is fairly well. And then we have decades, about 60 years of data saying that this is how we adapt or not adapt to the microgravity environment. And the big question mark is, how do humans do in partial gravity? So how will humans do in 17% gravity on the moon and 38% gravity on Mars? Um, and the answer is further studies are needed, which you know is exciting because there's more discovery to be made, um, but a little bit unsettling because we're actually proposing on sending humans to um, the moon. Uh, and beyond. And so um, this is a huge opportunity for us to learn more about, you know, how much gravity or how little gravity is enough gravity to prevent these fluid shifts, to prevent this bone loss, to prevent, um, you know, the um, the changes within our central nervous systems and um, the fluid around our brains and spines not draining properly. Um, so there's there's a lot of, um, it's a challenge, but it's also an opportunity um, to, to discover more and to bring those benefits back to um, like disease states on earth. Right, right. So, a uh, lot, lots happening, and you are in the thick of it. But uh, 
I'm sure you are also looking forward to really being in space to experience it yourself. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about Shauna. When is your first flight and uh, what happens? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I have no announcements of flight yet, but the we're also living in the age of commercial space flight. In the yeah. past two years alone, we have seen the successful rise of suborbital space flight with Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic. We've seen the rise of orbital space flight with for the Inspiration Four mission, continue on with the Axe One mission with Axiom, um, and then SpaceX is going back and doing more civilian missions with Polaris Dawn. Yeah. Um, so an incredible time for access as well. Um, so I'm I'm very hopeful about my own chances to someday get to space. Um, in addition to that, um, it's uh, the the bringing all of humanity with us. And so you know, I just spent all this time saying space is trying to kill us. Um, we should do select the healthiest of the healthy. We should do our best to prevent medical conditions in space. And that's the space agency approach. That's the NASA approach. That's the Canadian space agency approach. And then all of that goes out the window when we talk about commercial space. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so we're we're essentially saying, um, you know, we're sending everyone and their grandmother to space. We sent William Shatner, who's ninety two years right. old. Space. Um, so how do we reconcile that? And, and the answer is um, duration matters. And so when we talk about having sent um, folks who would have been medically disqualified out of the NASA program um, to go to space, um, the duration matters because we know that um, some of these effects don't happen until they, an astronaut has spent time in what we call long duration space flight, so beyond 30 days. So by comparison, a suborbital flight is minutes to hours. Um, whereas, and the orbital flights that have been um, taken on um, with SpaceX and Axiom have been on the order of five to 15 days so far. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're getting up there, um, but we're still not quite reaching those limits. So again, we're just managing risk to help increase accessibility to space. And my hope is that we'll continue this trend to further democratize access to space to underrepresented mm-hmm. groups. So only 12% of women um, or 12% of space explorers have been women. Yeah. 1%, 1% of that has been black women. Um, and then we haven't even talked about people who would have been medically disqualified, folks with disabilities, and we're seeing pushes to make space more accessible um, with um, dedicated programs like Astro Access to help folks with disabilities, Fly Zero G, or the ESA call for para-astronauts looking for those with lower limb discrepancies and mobility disorders, again, with the hope of helping folks with disabilities who previously would not have had access to space get to space. Yeah, so it sounds like, you know, uh, the world of aviation uh, in the early 1900s, where now all of those, you know, uh, types of people you described can be on a plane, and then that's where we are shooting for uh, from a, a suborbital or orbital flight perspective. Now, duration, so what's right now, what would you say is a duration where a commoner like me could be out there? Is it a few minutes, few hours, five to 15 days? Because 30 days you said is the long duration. So uh, what do you think uh, in your jargon is the right amount right now, short duration? I think up to, uh, so anywhere from minutes to, to a short amount of days, I think, you know, um, the pair, the flight profile of a subor- suborbital flight to 10 days is fine. Okay. Um, and in fact, um, what my research group has published the a literature review on medical guidelines for commercial space flight. And basically, we looked at the data of saying, well, how safe is it to send folks to suborbital space? Um, and, and the answer is, you know, despite all the challenges we just talked about, um, because it's so short duration, the studies um, on centrifuges on the ground said mm. that you look at anyone from 18 to 89 years old, you look at folks with insulin pumps, um, congenital heart defects, um, chronic diseases, and they all did well in these centrifuge studies. Mm. Um, and in fact, the most common reason that someone would be disqualified from suborbital space flight was um, being anxious, claustrophobic, having a panic attack, or simply doing something unsafe and not being able to follow instructions. And so that's promising because now suddenly um, short duration space flight is more accessible. Um, And then when we look at things to be mitigated, like um, psychological reasons, maybe those can be um, mitigated through training programs and exposure, for example, claustrophobia, and maybe that can be dealt with in space flight. Right. So uh, it's interesting that you describe more of the psychological factors as the barrier to be able to go into space. 
I've also read somewhere you talk about the astronaut mindset. So what is the astronaut mindset? And then can I, can others develop? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, that's one of my favorite things to talk about. And, you know, there's there's a couple of ways to think about it. So, uh, and there's um, uh, one framework that I like that talks about we're practicing what we call good expeditionary behavior. Um, mm. This is something um, that NASA really talked about during the first days of the pandemic. This is something um, uh, definitely uh, expounded upon by the National Outdoor Leadership School. And the idea is, um, we're really thinking of ourselves as a member within a team and our goals are fo uh, focused, our, our metric of success is looking at the mission objectives and the team objectives. And so um, how do we help ensure that? So in order to do that, we have to look at our own health and we have to have the um, fortitude of mind to say, oh, hey, I'm not doing so well today. How do I fix that? Or how do I let the team know? How do I bring myself to being um, you know, a, a good team member? And then the other part of that is looking in at the health of the team. Mm. Um, and saying, okay, the team's not doing so well. Maybe morale is low. How do we fix that? Or the team is behind or stressed. How do I contribute to helping out with that? And so the, the idea is you also have to look after yourself in order to help contribute to the health of the team. Um, and then there's other frameworks out there. And so, for example, thinking that no problem is unsolvable, we simply need to work the problem. And that's something that um, Canadian astronaut Chris Hatfield, you know, expounds upon a lot, really emphasizes. And then also being really resourceful, you know, realizing that we may be more resource limited than we are on Earth, but anything is a potential fix um, as long as we use it in the right way. And, you know, to that, the perfect example is Apollo 13 um, and, you know, using the, the materials they had on hand to fix their filtration system. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of ways to think about it, but basically it's a can-do add attitude, not giving up, no problems unsolvable, and we're here for ourselves and the team to achieve mission success. Yeah, that sounds so much like, you know, uh, what we teach our leadership students about how to live their life, right? Self-awareness, understand your mindset, the positive and negative talk you're giving to yourself, and then really have a growth mindset, be resourceful. Um, so it's really, you know, uh, how we can live a more fulfilled life on earth can help us live a more fulfilled life in, in space. So that's the mindset, but then let's talk about the body itself. I know you have been working with a space suit, the perfect space suit. So when we're going to the suborbital flight, will we need a perfect space suit or can we go dressed like we get on a plane? Yeah, that's that's a great question. And the, in the early days of suborbital space flight, when this was still a concept before we sent humans up to space, you know, there was question of sending um, folks in what we call intravehicular activity spacesuits, which is an indoor spacesuit versus an extravehicular activity spacesuit, which is a spacesuit we might use on a spacewalk outside the space station or on the moon. Um, and now when you see um, humans going up on suborbital flight, they're wearing flight suits. Um, so they, you know, they look like they're part of the crew, um, but they're very, a flight suit is just a comfy onesie. It's like, it's like pajamas. Right. There's no, there's no space. Yeah. Exactly. There's no spacesuit involved. Um, so the idea of having an IVA or inside spacesuit is have to act as a secondary life support system in case you lose atmosphere, for example, um, within your um, within your space capsule. Um, but what we've been seeing is that um, space flight participants, space tourists, you know, they want to be comfortable, they want to feel safe, and the environment of the suborbital capsule is safe enough that we could dress as if we um, were on a commercial um, air flight. Uh, and so right now there is, um, you know, it's, a, it's what we call a shirt sleeve environment. You could go dressed as you are today and be perfectly comfortable on a suborbital flight. Hmm. Interesting. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's it almost feels like you know getting on a plane. Hopefully, in a few years, uh, I was looking at this uh, balloon-based suborbital flight that the company in Florida is building. Where we are going to be down in Florida next week, and I I emailed them to see if I can really you know <laughs> visit and see the balloon. Um, oh, wonderful! <laughs> yeah, yeah, that'll be fun. Um, now, just shifting gears a little bit. So you said, you know, uh, the space environment provides a lot of opportunity for medical research. And you started to describe uh, some of that. Um, so talk to me a little bit more about what are the possibilities and do you really see space becoming uh, the place for medical research? Absolutely. And so this is 
I think um, what we've seen with human history is when you give humans a brand new platform to be creative on, um, the amount of discovery and um, and pushing the frontier, you know, increases exponentially. Um, so switching out of science for a second and talking about communication and entertainment and education. Mm -hmm. um, in the current age, when we've given people the opportunity to broadcast themselves on YouTube, on social media, when we've given them the access to teach themselves in non-traditional ways through massive online open courses, mm -hmm. um, we've seen an entire generation um, be able to educate themselves and educate others and communicate in ways we haven't seen before. Um, and so when we develop a new platform, we may have one or two intents in mind, and then human, humans just surprise us being curious creatures. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, what, what happens when we make space more accessible? Mm -hmm. um, from a science standpoint, what happens when we look at space as a avenue for manufacturing? And we know that certain aspects like um, uh, pharmaceuticals hold a lot of promise, semiconductors um, hold a lot of promise, new facets of materials engineering, um, for example, hold a lot of promise. And so how will the manufacturing industry, how will the R&D, uh, how will research and development all um, evolve in a zero G environment? And um, what kind of new materials and strengths can we, um, and uh, with new, can we engineer in a different, in an altered gravity environment? And that's just one of the potential uses um, or potential applications of democratizing access to space. What happens when we go outside the traditional population who's been in space? The really? scientists. What happens when we give entrepreneurs and athletes and um, artists access, um, unfettered access to space? So I think we're just getting started when we talk about how humanity can productively use space. And I'm really excited to see what comes of it. Right. Um, yeah, I also read about 3D bioprinting, you know, organ printing, et cetera, can happen better. You already talked about protein structures and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, it'll take some time, but how far away is that in your view? Is it 10 years away? Is it 30 years away? Is it 100 years away when space really becomes, you know, as common as, you know, let's set up an outsourcing center in India? I think the next decade will be historic for commercial space flight. I think we're already seeing it to, to date. And, you know, we've had, you know, we often talk about the exponential evolution of any technology or novel um, innovation. Yeah. And, you know, since 2009, we we had this promise of something called commercial suborbital space flight. And, you know, for a long time, it was a few years off the horizon. And then finally, last year, suborbital really became, you know, had, it came into fruition right. and you know that's when we start entering the the tail to the inflection point of um this uh, of exponential access to space and you know it's it's still it's still touch and go when you're in your in your infancy in a brand new um industry like commercial space um what the last two years the last 18 months have been extraordinarily promising um, by showing repeated successful spaceflight after spaceflight, expanding that to orbital spaceflight, um, expanding mission duration. And so as we crawl out of the tail, the, the lag end um, of this exponential access to space and reach the inflection point, I think over the next 10 years, um, it's going to be really telling um, to see, it, you know, when we look back saying, oh my gosh, look how much we, we accomplished. And, you know, to this practical point, you know, we're seeing more and more commercial players. And um, for example, we currently have, you know, publicly mentioned, at least we have plans for commercial space stations with NanoRacks, with Orbital Reef and Blue Origin, with Axiom, with Orbital Assembly and Partial Gravity. And um, so no one's shying away from space. Everyone wants to come. Everyone wants to play and talk about a business park um, in low Earth orbit to talk about a business park on the moon. So we're seeing just the very start of something historic. Uh, are there any names, and I'm talking purely, you know, health and medicine right now, are there any names that someone like me would know, uh, I mean, advisors of the world or, you know, Medtronics of the world that are active in the space, or is it more the startups like Luxonic, one you work with, that are more active? Um, yeah, that's a great question. And so um, definitely established um, research institutions and companies, pharmaceuticals are players in space. 
Um, and so, for example, the um, NIH definitely um, funds a, a lot of um, health studies that may offer to have return for Earth. Um, a lot of well-established institutions. And so um, I, I don't remember exactly which institutions were involved in the Rodent Research 19 experiment that came back from station in the past couple of years. Mm. But basically, it was a multidisciplinary study amongst NASA and multiple research partners. And what they did was they sent genetically engineered mice up to the station along with wild-type mice. Um, and the mutant mice were genetically engineered to be more muscular. And so if you look at a picture of these mice, you see, see these cute little muscular mice, very muscular next to these um, non-engineered mice. And then they in, um, in, introduced something called the ACVR2 neuromuscular blockade to help reduce the rate of bone and muscle breakdown. And what they found um, with the flown genetically engineered mice is that they had in less bone density loss and in some cases, increased muscle mass, um, which is promising for space, mm -hmm. for long duration space flight mm -hmm. for sure. And then it's also proposed to um, serve as a pathway to better understand neuromuscular degenerative di diseases, mm -hmm. as Shen's muscular dystrophy on earth. And so um, we're already seeing um, a lot of heavy presence amongst biomedical researchers um, in space for sure. And then um, definitely, I'm sure you'll have heard of Adidas, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so Adidas isn't doing manufacturing in space, but they've embarked on research and development in space. And they've looked at experiments um, with foam and shoe production and materials production in space from an R&D perspective, which is really interesting because I'm currently the primary investigator for a student payload that is uh, has that is proposed to and will soon be launching um, polyurethane foam in space. Um, and so the idea is in Earth, foam, foam is good. Foam has a lot of applications, whether it's from home repair to construction to bike helmets. Um, but in 1G, the bubbles that make up foam in the structure don't distribute evenly. Mm. Some bubbles yeah. fall downwards and they're smaller. And um, so the idea is, if we build foam in space, um, when the even when the bubbles are more evenly distributed and possibly bigger because they're not popped by gravity, does that give us a better foam? And so, um, you know, I'm privileged enough to be um, overseeing as a student group who has who has proposed exactly that, um, and we're really excited to see what results come of us. Okay, good, good, uh, very interesting. Uh, what about food? Food in space, space food. Yeah, we haven't even talked about that yet. And so um, when we talk about the challenges of nutrition in space, um, part of it is um, the challenges of packing for space. We only have so much room. So yeah. things we bring with us to space have to be lightweight, low volume. They have to be uh, long shelf life. Um, they can't go rotten. Um, they have to be delicious, and that changes. Um, the definition of what's delicious in space changes because of the fluid shift that happens in zero G, astronauts feel like they're congested. And so astronauts will have this moon face, puffy face appearance, and they feel like they have a cold. So they feel like um, you know they're always stuffed up. So food doesn't taste as good in space. And so knowing that um, the food that goes up to the space station, not only does it have to be lightweight, not, uh, inexpensive, long shelf life, it has to be delicious, it has to be nutritious, it has to be textured, um, maybe more spicy, more flavorful. And so we we deal with that with um, on station with, you know, freeze dry, dried food, with long shelf life food, with um, food straight out of the bag, things that you don't necessarily need to spend a lot of time preparing and with resupply. Um, there are some experiments with growing lettuce on station, but for the, for for all intents and purposes, food on ISS is dealt with through resupply. And then things that might be perishable um, that would be considered a treat, like an orange because it's heavy and not having a long shelf life, you know, might come up for Christmas. Hmm. So all of that goes out the window when we talk about long duration space flight to Mars. Um, you know, you're not going to be able to rely easily on resupply on a three to five year mission pro uh, profile. It takes six to nine months one way to get to Mars. And so resupply isn't coming frequently. So now we have to talk about, well, the things that we do send with us have to have a longer shelf life but while still being nutritious, delicious, 
flavorful. Um, and then we also have to talk about increasing um, our autonomy when it comes to food supply. Um, so one of the com uh, companies that I advise is called Astrius, and they're working on the um, the long duration, long shelf life, um, nutritious alternative. And so one of their products, it looks like a Ferrero Rocher, but it has your recommend hundred percent of your recommended daily intake of most of your um, vitamins, and in additionally has nootropics to help for um, short bursts of cognitive performance. And so then the the next gap is okay. How do we do food production on Mars? How do we optimize that? What does agriculture on the Red Planet look like? So these are all fascinating questions that people are looking at today. Very, very interesting that you describe uh, uh, food as the uh, Ferrero Rocher chocolate because in one of our class sessions last year, we were talking about climate crisis and Earth, and we were talking about food supply. Uh, and uh, one of the comments that I made was food is essentially energy. And if you can put in a pill, you may get away from the need to really harvest long uh, stretches of land. And I was laughed at. But it sounds like uh, if you can actually create these low volume, highly nutritious, flavorful chocolates, for lack of a better term, that is where a lot of research is happening. Uh, and you see that coming back to Earth as a food source as well. Yeah, I think it's I think it's kind of funny because, you know, growing up watching the Jetsons, watching, you know, what the vision of the future was like in the 50s, you know, you would see them eat a single pill and it right. would be an entire meal. And now we've come a little bit full circle to that, but it tastes better than a little pill. Um, so definitely with Astrius, we found um, lots of application. I was recently in Poland and Ukraine on a medical deployment mm. and I brought it with me there because it was portable and meant for austere environments. Um, you know, I've, I've handed it out to my explorer friends when they go to austere environments. I gave it to a friend who recently climbed Kilimanjaro. Um, so there's lots of application and then even day to day life. Um, you know, I there's a joke in emergency medicine that if it's not portable, you won't eat it. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, even bringing it with me um, when I'm working in a clinic, you know, it has lots of applications for the bus any busy professional. Um, there's a lot of uh, application there. And so um, the and that's one small part of the puzzle um, because, you know, it's it's one thing to bring something with long shelf life. Um, but the other part is increasing our capabilities to exist in situ. And so I think the other part of the puzzle is creating sustainable um farming, agricultural, and food manufacturing practices that make use of the resources um, on Mars, uh, as well as um, can be as sustainable as possible. So the other part of that equation is looking at closed loop life support systems right, right. and increasing their efficiency when it comes to recycling water, recycling air, and minimizing any wastage or leakage. Hmm, interesting. So a couple more questions. Um, uh, will we ever need to exit Earth to build life in space? Because, you know, you just described how <laughs> life on Earth is becoming uh, challenging. Say the question again. So the question is, will we ever exit Earth to live yeah. in space? Just, <laughs> just abandon Earth. Um, so there's a, there's this running joke in the space world that says um, the dinosaurs didn't have a space program and where are they now? And so the joke is if you put seven billion eggs in one proverbial basket, well, you know, you can easily be knocked out by a massive solar flare or an asteroid or some sort of cosmic event. Um, and so I don't know that that needs to be either or. I don't know that we need to talk about only living on Earth or only living um, off world. But I do think, um, you know, for survival, for the survival imperative, there is a good argument to be made for being a multi-planetary species. Um, and then humans are fundamentally curious. You know, it's that's part of what it means to be human is to ask, what happens if I do this? What happens if I go there? Um what happens, you know, if I if I explore there? And I think that's part of what it means to be humans in space is, you know, okay, we got to low Earth orbit. Where do we go to next? Okay, we got to the moon. Where do we go to next? Um, and so I think that's the other, the more philosophical part of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it is very, very clear that you yourself uh, are a very curious person and you are <laughs> looking at exploring, you know, so much which is out there, which is wonderful. So what advice do you have for aspiring space physicians or, you know, space astronauts? Yeah, I think um, for space physicians, um, I hope it's become apparent that there's no shortage of problems to solve. Um, in fact, we're only learning that there's more and more um, 
uh, questions to be answered. So in the past two years alone, you know, we've um, learned about the potential for space to be a cause for blood clots, which is concerning. Uh, in the past 15 years, we've learned about the impaired drainage of the cerebrospinal fluid, the brain and spine juice that um, bathes our spines, uh, our central nervous system. Um, and so every single space flight, there's more and more data coming back. And so if you're interested in space and space medicine, absolutely, we need you. Um, there's no shortage of problems to be solved. Get involved with research, come to space medicine conferences. Um, if you want to practice as a flight surgeon, look into um, clinical opportunities, look into aerospace residencies, but definitely space needs you. Okay. Uh, excellent. Excellent. Uh, any closing thoughts, Tana? I mean, it's, it's just been a pleasure. You uh, very clearly are uh, not only very curious but very deep and uh, really have a very very you know good understanding of what's happening uh, from field of uh, medicine but also you know broadly um so where, where will we see shauna next year and uh, what's next for shauna um What's next? So next year, my um, as travel has opened up, I'm getting back into um, lots of travel, lots of operations. Um, so I'm teaching my space medicine yeah. course. I'm getting back into um, astronautics operations with the International Institute for Astronautical Sciences, continuing my work with virtual reality and luxonic yes. um, and orbital assembly. That's what the immediate and near term holds. And then who knows, maybe several years from now, you'll see me in space. Oh, uh, uh, we would be so proud to see you in space. And uh, uh, of course, you know, we are rooting for you. <laughs> <Thank> uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, it's been such a pleasure, uh, Shana. Wonderful, wonderful to speak with you. And thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you. So and, much for I look forward to keeping in touch and you know learning more from you. Likewise, thank you, Rich, and have a wonderful um, day. And I hope that your your viewers and your class have enjoyed this conversation as much as I have. Uh.